This is the fourth in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In the previous lecture, we defined the notion of smooth map between manifolds. In this lecture, we want to differentiate smooth maps between manifolds. First, we'll review some theorems from several variable calculus, and then we'll define the notion of the velocity of a moving point on a manifold. And then finally, we'll define the notion of, of differentiation of a smooth map between manifolds. Suppose that um, U is an open set in Rn, and we take a map, um, say phi takes U to Rn, or to some set in Rn, and we'll say that, um, that phi of x is a big O of x to mean that uh, phi of x goes to 0 as x goes to 0, phi of x goes to 0 as x goes to 0, and that uh, phi of x is little o of x to mean that phi of x divided by the norm of x goes to 0 as x goes to 0. So um, in particular, the map is continuous um, when this happens, phi of, x minus, phi of x plus h minus phi of x is O of h. That's uh, continuous. And um, so uh, naturally we want to think about being differentiable, and that would be essentially the same sort of expression, but um, phi of x plus h minus phi of x should be some phi prime of x, h, plus something which is uh, little o of h. Okay. Um, and uh, that would be, uh, so if this happens, then uh, then this guy is called as a, the derivative, um, the derivative um, of phi at x. Now, of course, this looks exactly like one variable calculus, but for many variable calculus, the h here is a vector. Um, and so the phi prime expression here is a matrix. Um, it, the derivative is a matrix, and you are, are familiar with the fact that if uh, we write y equals phi of x, then um, phi prime of x uh, for a smooth function will be um, the matrix of partial derivatives. If uh, if uh, phi um, uh, is uh, continuously differentiable, well. Um, continuously uh, differentiable. And, of course, continuously differentiable means, in other words, that phi in, is continuous and also that phi prime is continuous. Um, and we'll be interested in, in smooth maps. So um, so smooth for us means that, um, that all the derivatives exist of all orders. Um, all derivatives of all orders. Um, so, uh, and of course, a diffeomorphism is um, a diffeomorphism means a smooth map with a smooth inverse. A smooth map with a smooth inverse. Um, so, uh, so that's the the terminology that you should hopefully be familiar with. Uh, some people use a different notation for derivatives, maybe a capital D instead of a prime symbol for a derivative of a map of several variables. Um, I like the prime symbol, but it doesn't really matter. The notation's not too important. Um, in this notation, though, we do have, of course, the chain rule, um, which is that um, if you have maps, uh, F and G, and if the composition is defined, then the derivative matrix of the composition is the product of the derivative matrix evaluated at the point g of x times the derivative matrix evaluated at g prime of x. So that's a, a convenient notation to use because it makes the, the rules of calculus look very much like one variable calculus. And as usual, we can think of the derivative as being a kind of linear approximation. When we have a map, after all, that's exactly what this is saying. We approximate with this linear map. So this nonlinear map, um, phi of x plus h, is just phi of x plus a linear correction term. And so the linear approximation is the derivative. I want to state three big theorems from several variable calculus, the inverse function theorem, the implicit function theorem, and the rank theorem. These might not have been covered in your several variable calculus class, but they are covered in all the standard textbooks on the subject.
Um, so I won't prove them. I'll just state them. And uh, you can look elsewhere for the proofs. Obviously, you're not responsible for knowing how to prove them. But uh, it's important to know these, these theorems because they're useful for constructing examples of manifolds. So the first one is the inverse function theorem. Um, so if we have a um, we have a, an open set so theorem uh, inverse function theorem probably should be called the inverse map theorem for us since we tend to refer to multivariable functions as maps. Um, so we take an open subset of R n and we take a map. Smooth again. Smooth for us means that it has derivatives of all orders, and we can differentiate in any way we like um, with regard to any of the variables any number of times. Um, so uh, there's a smooth map, and um, then the following are equivalent. Um, the um, this guy, this matrix, is an invertible matrix at some point x naught. Oh, maybe I should make x naught be a point. Um, x naught is a point of view. Um, so then uh, this is an invertible matrix exactly when um, after perhaps this is the tricky bit it's a bit hard, complicated to say but what I want to say is that if this is invertible then the map is invertible roughly speaking but the more precise statement is that if this if this is invertible then my map V uh, is actually invertible near X naught so uh, one kind of motto to keep in mind is that uh, we're saying that somehow linearly implies locally. If linearly the linear approximation to the map is invertible, then the actual map is invertible, but only locally. So we have to state what we mean by locally. So here's locally after perhaps replacing u by um, a smaller open set. So we might not be able to get away with the u we were given, but a smaller open set containing this x naught point. So then, once that's done, um, phi uh, is a is a diffeomorphism. Um, so it's a smooth map with a smooth inverse of so let's say phi takes um, this u, which is some open set in our n, to some set which I guess we'll have to call phi of u since we didn't write a name for it. This is contained in our n open set, and this is contained in our n another open set. Okay, so that's how we can tell if a map is a nonlinear map is invertible. How do we decide? We decide by checking the you know, the the invertibility of the linear approximation to the map, and if that works, then at least locally the map's invertible. So it's a convenient way to think of it that linearly implies locally. Moreover, the the the, uh, the inverse function theorem gives us not just this information, but a little bit more. It also tells us how to calculate the inverse. It's easy to check that if it has an inverse, then it would have to have this property: phi prime at uh, phi inverse prime at y is phi prime at x inverse. Where this side we're inverting the the map, possibly nonlinear map phi, and on this side we're taking the matrix phi prime of x and inverting if uh, y is of x. So we've got the y here and the x here. So you invert a matrix in this side. Here you invert a map and then and then differentiate to get the, the matrix. So um, so it allows us to calculate the derivative of the inverse map without knowing what the inverse map is, and it proves the inverse map exists. So let's take a simple example of the inverse function theorem. Um, although it is a ver several variable calculus theorem, so we're not really, um, this isn't really the material of, of, our, of our module, but um, Let's take a look at maybe some uv variables depending on some xy variables according to some simple formula like x squared minus y squared and 2xy. So this is the value of u, the function u at each xy, and this is the value of the function v at each xy. Let's calculate out what this phi prime is. You know it's the matrix of, of derivatives, so phi prime of x and y at each point x and y is the matrix of du dx du dy dv dx and dv dy. You can do the differentiation. 2x minus 2y, uh, 2y and 2x. And so um, so the determinant of that matrix, well, I want to know if it's an invertible matrix, so I'll check its determinant. Its determinant is uh, this times this minus that times that is 4x squared plus y squared. And so it's not 0. Except at, except if uh, x and y are both zero at the origin of coordinates of the plane. So in a picture, 
what this looks like is that we have a, an x, y plane, and we have a u, v plane, and we have a map that takes this phi, that takes points of one plane to points of the other, so it takes some point here to some point, say here, and it, it uh, and and then uh, we can ask if it's invertible. Uh, what we've discovered is that we don't know what happens if this if we point we start at is that the origin in the x y coordinates. We don't know whether or not there's an inverse map, and it turns out there actually isn't one. But we do know that there has to be some tiny neighborhood, according to the theorem, some sufficiently small open set maybe so so in this case our set u where the map was defined was the whole plane but we could maybe take a smaller set u some little tiny neighborhood around this guy and then according to the theorem there is some little corresponding tiny little neighborhood around the image guy here so that the inverse actually exists let's take a look at this example though if you think about it if you take a point here if you were to change the sign of x and of y and take the exact a point exactly opposite the origin um, the map is u is x squared minus y squared, and v is 2xy. So if you change the sign of x, that doesn't change the sign of x squared. If you change the sign of y, it doesn't change the sign of y squared. And if you change the sign of both x and y, it doesn't change the sign of their product. So if I take this point and I reflect it all across the origin to the opposite point, then I get another um, uh, point that goes to the same place here. So in fact, the um, this point and this point are both mapped to the same place in the UV uh, variables. They both map to the same point. And we know that by the inverse function theorem, there's a tiny little neighborhood in which this thing has an inverse. But there's also a tiny little neighborhood by the same theorem in which the map, when restricted to this tiny open set, also the, still the same map phi, but restricted to this tiny open set, also has an inverse. So we have to be a bit careful. There's an inverse this way as well. So when you live in here, there's more than one inverse. There's a local inverse going over here and another local inverse going over there. So that's one of the subtleties of this, of this theorem. So the, the implicit function theorem is our next theorem, and it's essentially the same result as the inverse function theorem, but if we allow parameters, instead of allowing, instead of having one map phi, imagine we have a map phi, but it depends on some parameters, and uh, we want to say that if it depends on them smoothly, then this inverse map should depend smoothly as well. So let's try and state that. Um, so we have um, the theorem is the implicit function theorem, and again, it probably should for us be the implicit map theorem since we're doing many variable maps. Um, so we take u, an open subset in Rp plus q, so we have p variables and q variables, and we'll write a point, each point of u, we'll write as, say, x and y, with x being the first p of the variables, and y being uh, being the, the last q variables. So I don't really distinguish, as I may have pointed out that I, I don't really distinguish between vector variables and, 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 and individual variables, and you have to just keep track of what I mean. Um, so then uh, we'll write the map. We'll write a map. Let's see. So we have a map. Uh, U goes to R, Q, and it'll be smooth. Um, and uh, we'll write the map as, as Z is phi of X and Y. And um, now what we want to do is to... Um, is to uh, write the, the find the, the derivative matrix in this simple setting. Um, we'll write dz, dy. I don't want to differentiate the x variables, just the y variables. So we'll write that to mean the matrix of all the z derivatives with regard to all the y variables in all possible ways. So this is the matrix whose entries are these derivatives. So now suppose that that matrix is invertible. Suppose that at some uh, point x, y equals some x naught, y naught uh, point of, of u. Um, this matrix is invertible. Um, and note that it is actually a square matrix. Um, and let's let uh, z naught be the corresponding image point. Then um, um, there, uh, for any x close enough to uh, to x naught, um, and uh, any z 
close enough to Z naught, there is a unique uh, Y close enough to Y naught, say, uh, let's call it Y equals Y of uh, X and Z, so that uh, solving the equation, sorry, where are we? Solving uh, the equation uh, Z is phi of X and Y. So I can write down this equation. I want, uh, I have given, given x and y, I want to find z. Uh, sorry, given x and z, I want to find y so that it satisfies this equation. So I have an equation to satisfy and an unknown y in it. And what I'm saying is that there is a solution, and it, there's a unique solution, and uh, moreover, it's smooth. Moreover, sorry, uh, moreover, um, y of x and z is smooth. So you can implicitly define y as a function of x and z by this equation. That's why it's called implicit function theorem. And, uh, and, and it's a smooth function. And all you need to check is the invertibility of a certain matrix. Of course, this theorem is very classical and very well known. So it's, um, it's not going to be a surprise to you that how it works. Um, it maybe you haven't seen a multi several variable version of it, but it's essentially the same as the one variable calculus version. So, um, so not too surprising. Um, so let's go on to the rank theorem, which is probably less commonly um, not kind of less commonly presented in several variable calculus classes. So the the rank theorem is concerned with a different question. Rather than trying to prove the solvability of equations, it's really concerned with the question of how to decide if a map can be made into linear map by change of variables. So we want to say um, so this is the rank theorem. Um, so in this case, we have U uh, contained in R P open, open set, and phi takes U to R, let's say Q, is um, smooth. And uh, we suppose that uh, phi prime um, of X has, uh, as, a, as a matrix, has constant rank. So when we say that a map has constant rank, we always mean the, the derivative uh, matrix having constant rank. We talk about a constant rank map. We mean a map for which the derivative has constant rank. Um, so then um, phi becomes a linear map after uh, locally, uh, at least locally, and after change of variables. So I'll make that more precise. You have to change the input and output variables to get it to work. Let's be more precise about what exactly does that mean. Um, what does it mean to become a linear map after a change of variables? So what I mean is that um, uh, for every, so first I have to say locally. What does it mean by locally? As usual, we have to restrict. Um, so for any point x not uh, in u, um, after perhaps replacing this is how we localize around the x naught after perhaps replacing u by uh, a smaller open set around x naught, so containing this x naught, um, then um, uh, there are uh, there are diffeomorphisms. I'll just write diffios. Um, Let's say there are some C and there's some key so that um, key phi C inverse is a linear map. And you can even make it be whatever linear map you want of the given rank um, because they're all the same under some change of variables and the inputs and outputs. Okay, so that's the rank theorem. Again, not, not something you may have seen, but uh, we won't give a proof. Um, it's a fairly standard result. So the question is when we can linearize a map, in other words, turn it into a linear map by some change of variables, and that's just when its derivative has constant rank. And we'll say phi has constant rank to mean that the derivative matrix has the same rank for any value of x, for any point x. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is to think about uh, what it means to have a little particle moving um, around in a manifold, and what's, it, what's its velocity? So we do know what it means for a particle to move smoothly. Um, so imagine we have a manifold M. We have a little particle on it moving. So we watch it move. 
uh, over time it moves some somehow and um, at some instant t on time it's at some particular point so it's along some path I'll usually use little m for a point of a manifold uh, capital M and so on that sort of notation to represent um, that to, to keep track of which point belongs to which manifold by using the same letter so this little m of t moves along this path and at time t it's at a location m of t inside our manifold now that makes perfect sense because in fact we could just say that little m is actually a, a map that takes an open interval of the real number line and maps it to m so that makes perfect sense to say what a path is but what's what does the what does the notion of velocity mean we don't have a well defined notion of this because um, their usual notion in calculus would be to try and make a difference quotient and take a limit, but there's no notion of making differences inside an abstract manifold. This is just some set with some abstract smooth structure, and so I can't take two points and figure out what the difference is between them. It doesn't make sense. It's not defined. I, I suppose one way out of this is to think of how do scientists actually measure in the world we live in. It's just some kind of manifold the surface of the earth or measuring the motions of planets and uh, stars. How do we actually do measurements? You could say that what we do is we have a, a manifold um, that we're, we're measuring where things are moving, say some uh, celestial bodies or some other kind of, of phenomena that we're measuring in scientifically. And so what we do is we make measurements of where it is. Um, so we measure using some variables. Let's say x1 and x2 represent a local picture of where this thing is and bit more x's if there are more variables we have to measure so we measure this phenomenon over time and uh, so we have this this particle flying through space or through a lying on some surface or something like this we describe where it is by measuring values of variables what do we mean by that well we mean exactly that we've got some kind of way of associating to each possible location it could have some location in these variables and so we have, in other words, a chart. So if there's a point here, m naught, there'll be a corresponding point, say x naught, um, where x naught is simply phi of of m naught uh, for a map phi, which is just a chart. So that's what real scientists are actually, in some sense, doing. They're always measuring where things are by measuring values of variables. In other words, taking a chart. And so we have this kind of notion then that how do they figure out the velocity of a, of a moving object? We have this particle moving here. And what we do is we, while it stays inside the domain of the chart, we can measure. We can't measure what was it was doing out here, but while it's in here, we can measure. Um, and it moves around, and there it is. Uh, so we get a moving point, which is um, x of t is simply phi of m of t. And after all, that's what we do when we do scientific experiments. So... Um, so that that's perfectly fine, and we have a perfectly well-defined object um, x prime of t at every prime t. It's trivially defined simply to be the derivative of smooth map applied to smooth map. And you, this is a smooth map that eats an abstract manifold and spits out uh, uh, elements and points in Euclidean space. This thing takes a, a time in, in Euclidean real numbers and, and gives an abstract point in a manifold. So when you go through the whole story, you're starting with a, with a number, a time, a t, uh, an ordinary real variable, and you're ending up in an ordinary Euclidean variables, and so this is perfectly well defined. Imagine two scientists are trying to measure the same experiment. So there uh, is some manifold, and there is some path on this manifold, and then there's some point m naught, and um, the path is some m of t moving path fly flying through space on this manifold, and then we have one scientist measuring, so your you know, scientific experiments are going on. You're measuring with some phi, and you're finding that it, it uh, the, the resulting uh, a path that you measure here is some uh, x of t, and it passes through some point x naught at, at let's say time. Uh, let's suppose this is time t equals t naught when it passes through there. And then the problem is, of course, there's not just one scientist. You've got on the opposite side of the Earth you've got another scientist who's measuring the, uh, the same planets or stars, but he's measuring from a different perspective, he or she, from a different perspective, different angle, different, uh, different telescope, and coming up with different numbers, and they have to be related somehow. So a different chart, say C, going off to some other variables, let's call them Y1 and Y2, and then uh, in the C chart, um, 
this corresponding point, there's a corresponding point, say y naught, and there's a path here, so y of t. And um, so we have to figure out how these how these are related. Well, they're related very simply in that each point x naught um, it becomes a point um, in in your measurements becomes in in my measurements becomes the point y naught, which is simply uh, the transition map uh, psi uh, c uh, phi of x naught. So points go to points by points as you measure them go to points as I measure them by the transition map. But how do velocities uh, vary then? Well, if we had a moving point, an x of t, then it would correspond to a y of t by the, the transition map. Uh, sorry, that should be phi inverse uh, c, phi inverse x of t. Um, so let's, it's convenient to just write the, the, the transition map as, um, as y of x. This is a bit um, uh, not, not very careful. Some people wouldn't like this because I'm using y of t for the, par the path of the moving point in the y variables, but I'm using y of x for the, for the transition map that changes x variables to y variables. And so um, using that notation, we get simply that y of t, uh, the moving par particle in y coordinates, is y of x of t. Okay, it's not a very interesting uh, observation that in order to figure out how the particle moves in the y variables, you figure out how it moves in the x variables and then change variables. Um, so, but then we get the, uh, the obvious trivial observation that if we differentiate and look at time t naught, we get y of uh, y prime at x of t naught times x prime of t naught. Or uh, maybe finally, um, oh, sorry, it's a little bit off the page. Um, so, uh, so finally we get that, that the velocity at time t naught in your variables is, we know what x of t naught is, it's just x naught at times the velocity in my variable, or your variables, in my variables and your variables. So we see it, we get a formula for how to change variables from velocities to velocities. So we could say that the change of variables formula, maybe summing that up, the change of variables formula for how to change um, po points into points is that the position of a point in y variables is the transition map applied to the position of the point in x variables and the uh, velocity of a point in uh, y variables is the transition map applied derivative at that corresponding point in x variables applied to the velocity in x variables. And this, of course, is the transition map matrix. This is the matrix of the derivatives of the transition map, so of partial derivatives. Right? So, so that's, uh, that's the, a formula that enables you to, that's just a chain rule, but it enables you to change velocities to velocities. So you have a, a rule for changing points to points and a rule for changing velocities to velocities. But all that said, it doesn't give us any definition of what is m prime. Um, what is the velocity of something that's actually on the manifold? What we've said is, if we were to measure in a chart, we could measure in the x variables uh, using the chart phi, and we get a velocity. If we were to change charts, we could measure in the y variables and get a velocity, uh, a, a y prime velocity of the in the y variables. But what is the velocity itself? There really isn't a definition, so we need to adopt one. So what we'll do is to say that um, that it'll be called a, a tangent vector, and we'll have to define it essentially by saying you get to measure it in your variables, I get to measure it in my variables, and we'll define that the measurements are equivalent if they're matched up by this thing. Let's make that precise. First of all, terminology in the subject is a bit strange. Um, it's uh, th what we've described as velocity um, vectors are always called by differential geometers uh, tangent vectors. Um, which sounds like it has to do with the tangent function, but it's more to do with tangency in the sense of just glancing off of an object. So if we were to make a surface, um, uh, for example, like a horse's saddle, and if the surface sat in Euclidean space, so now not not dealing with an abstract manifold, suppose our manifold M is actually a concrete surface given in, in, in a Euclidean space, and you sit at a point of this surface, then uh, you can imagine particles flying through that where you're sitting, you watch the paths of the particles go as they pass through where you sit. Each one has a velocity vector. These velocity vectors um, sp uh, all sit just glancing off the surface at that point. They're all in the plane that just glances off the surface at that point. They're in the tangent plane. And that's why we refer to velocity vectors as tangent vectors.
it's just a parenthetical remark, but uh, it is annoying that uh, we don't call them velocity vectors. We always call them tangent vectors because we think of the manifold as being like a surface in Euclidean space, a curved surface. And if it were a curved surface, the velocity of any particle moving on the surface would have to be uh, given by a vector that's just tangent to, just glancing off the surface at that point. So the, the notation uh, and terminology will always be, rather than saying velocity vector, we'll always talk about a tangent vector. Okay, so finally we want to have a definition of what is such a thing. Um, so a tangent uh, vector representative at a point m naught in a manifold m is a pair uh, phi v, where phi is a chart, or that's the map of the chart. We've sometimes called our charts u phi. Um, uh, so maybe u phi is the chart really, and phi is the map that appears in the chart. I make that a bit. I'll leave that a bit vague. Um, and then v is the as a velocity vector, which I think of as I think that you're going to use this this chart to measure your velocities in, and that's going to be the velocity you measure. Um, and so um, we'll say that your velocity as you measure it, that's your velocity vector that you've measured in that chart, is equivalent to my velocity as I've measured it at the point m naught. If, um, if the transition map, so that was this guy, um, derivative at the point, the corresponding, that's the corresponding point x naught, is uh, it's already applied to your vector, gives you my vector, let's put it this way, w, my vector is a transition map derivative applied to your vector, um, where x naught is, of course, just as we had the notation above, x naught is simply v of m naught. So, uh, so in other words, I'm just going to use the definition that you get to measure as you like to measure, and you measure the velocity the way you do, and I measure it the way I do, and then we ma agree that, that our our, our measurements match up if they if they are carried one to the other by the derivative. The velocity vectors carried one to another by the derivative of the transition map. So that'll be the the definition of uh, of, of of an equivalence between them and the equivalence classes. Um, an equivalence class is called a tangent vector. That'll be the definition of a tangent vector. It's just an equivalence class into this relation. You do your measurements your way, I do my measurements my way, and they, if the velocities are matched up by the rule for velocities, then we consider them to be the same, uh, to represent the same tangent vector. Now, um, tangent vector representatives can be added in an obvious way. Um, if we have um, uh, two, if you measure two velocity vectors in your uh, in your uh, your chart of two different particles, let's say, you can define the sum of them to be that guy. And that, of course, uh, works perfectly well. If I change, you change from your chart to mine, then in my chart, these both get uh, mapped by some ma same matrix, and so uh, matrices preserve linear operations. They're linear transformations, and so these get um, to be transformed in, in, into the corresponding sum. So this is well defined actually on tangent vectors. And similarly for scaling, uh, that gives a, a definition of how to add and scale uh, tangent vectors by adding and scaling representatives in the same chart. And then uh, you can always switch them to be in the same chart and then calculate and then uh, switch back again when you're done. So you don't have to, they don't have to initially be defined in the same chart. You get to switch them to be defined in the same chart, then you calculate the, the sum. So that means that, um, that as a result, uh, tangent vectors form a, form a vector space. So uh, tangent vectors at m naught form a vector space. At the same point, m naught form a vector space. And that fits intuitively with the little uh, plane we saw glancing off the, the surface. Um, so um, ignoring that picture, though, let's, do, let's say what we mean by this vector space. So let's give it a name anyway, um, tm naught. m is the, um, the set of tangent vectors at m naught. Um, and it's a vector space. Um, so intuitively, it, it represents motions uh, away from the point m naught. So if we have some sort of some sort of uh, abstract manifold, then uh, then 
when we sit at some point of that manifold, then we think of the point itself as representing somehow the zero motion not moving. And if it moved a little bit this way, you'd get some tangent vector. Moving a little bit that way, you'd get some tangent vector. That's how the picture we're going to draw. We'll think of it as being given by a plane glancing off the thing. You have to be a bit careful, though, because in the picture, we're identifying the point at which this, this plane is glancing off with the, with, with the zero vector. And that, that's a bit confusing. Um, nevertheless, that's sort of the picture we'll think of when we draw tangent vectors. We'll have that picture in mind as little velocities of little particles uh, moving through this, this particular point, m naught. So then if we happen to have a path uh, in a manifold, in a manifold M, we can simply define M prime of T is defined to be the equivalence class of um, uh, any, you can take any chart, and then you take the chart and compose it with the path, and then you take that velocity in Euclidean space. Yeah, at the, so that, that'll give us... Um, a perfectly well-defined notion, as long as the chart is defined, obviously, near near m of t, right, uh, at time t. So that'll be perfectly well-defined notion of being the velocity vector of a path. Now, if we have um, a map of manifolds, we want to figure out how to define um, what happens uh, with, uh, um, with the velocity vectors on one manifold and on the other. So imagine we have a manifold... Um, say P, and it maps by some map, let's call it capital F, to a manifold, let's say, uh, Q. And then we're interested in taking tangent vector at a point, so we have point P naught and tangent vector V, and then we want to construct the corresponding tangent vector. What do we mean by corresponding? Well, this V is a velocity of a moving point, so, um, so if we imagine an actual moving point with that velocity, some p of t, um, and then so that at time that some particular time, say p uh, uh, time t naught is the p naught point we want. So pick this, pick any path with that velocity vector v, and then make the corresponding path. What's the corresponding path? It should be the path that moves, let's say, q of t, given by the formula that the path, uh, the corresponding point q should be the image of the corresponding point p. So if you have a point P, it, uh, it gets mapped by a capital F to a point Q. And so we do that at each time T to give us uh, a way to associate to a path P of T, a path Q of T. And then we want simply to define the, the uh, derivative by the chain rule. So we want, uh, we, we definitely want a chain rule. We definitely want that F prime at P naught times the velocity um, is uh, uh, supposed to be... Um, uh, the the uh, q prime of t naught, so or in other words, I could say maybe it's better to write it as f prime of p naught. Uh, p prime of t is q prime of t naught at t naught is q prime of t naught. So in other words, I want a chain rule. I want to this is this is mostly my chain rule. If you like, you could write it as f prime at p naught p prime at t naught is f composed with p prime at t naught. So I'd like that chain rule. Um, but uh, you can check, I'll leave you to check, that that actually works as a definition. If you'd use this as, a, a, you can check that this is well-defined um, by uh, spilling out all the charts. How do you do it? You have to make charts here, two different possible charts here, some phi naught, c naught, and some phi one, c one here. Different charts, and see that if you, if you uh, compute that using your chain rule, that in fact... Uh, this is well defined, so I'll leave you to check that. It's a, it's, it's not a very difficult exercise. You have to consider possible charts, two possible charts, and see what happens when you change them. See two possible charts. See what cha happens when you change them here. And does this uh, actually make sense? Does it uh, define a unique linear map that takes vectors in uh, one tangent space to vectors in the other? So I claim it defines a unique. So there exists unique uh, linear map. Uh, f prime of p naught. There exists a unique linear map that takes the tangent space at this point to this guy to the tangent space at the corresponding point on the corresponding guy so that it matches up the velocities of paths. And then it becomes fairly clear that we should have a bigger chain rule. Once we have a that chain rule for paths, and that's actually defining what we mean by uh, the derivative of a map, right? We've just defined the derivative of a map to be the thing that makes the chain rule work. Then we expect a, a bigger chain rule, 
um, which is uh, again an exercise to show um, uh, if we have some f and it takes some p to some q and we have some g which takes q to some um, I don't know r but careful here r here is not the same as uh, r with the double bar this is the real number line this is just anything called capital r um, so uh, so we have this these smooth maps of manifolds then we want to claim that if you compose them and take the derivative at a point um, as a linear map, this is a linear map, what, what linear map, where should it go? Uh, the composition goes from P to R, so this should take the tangent space at P naught to P to the tangent space at R naught to R, where let's say Q naught is F of P naught as before, and then R naught is G of Q naught. Uh, so we take a point here, we look at its image here, we look at its image here, and what we're claiming is that if you compose the maps and then differentiate, then I claim that that's equal to um, the, uh, uh, what am I doing at Q naught? Um, G prime at Q naught, F prime at P naught. So in other words, the chain rule works exactly as you'd expect, where this is a composition of linear maps. This is a linear map and this is a linear map. So we have a linear map, um, let's say we could write it this way. We have a linear map F prime at P naught, uh, which takes tangent space at P naught to tangent space at Q naught. And then we have a, a G prime at Q naught takes tangent space at Q naught to tangent space at R naught. And then we have the composition, which is um, G prime at Q naught, F prime at P naught. And we claim that that's G composed with F prime at P naught. So that's the chain rule in this fancy language. So I'm leaving you to check a bunch of things um, to make sure that all that makes sense. Um, and of course, some of those things are, are checked in the lecture notes or are given as exercises in the lecture notes. Some, I think some of them have solutions in the back. Um, so we now want to state our big three theorems, the inverse function theorem, implicit function theorem, and rank theorem on manifolds um, so that we can use them to construct new manifolds from old manifolds. So in this language, we want to say the inverse function theorem just becomes the following um, rather trivial uh, result from the previous inverse function theorem. Inverse function theorem on manifolds says that, um, suppose that um, phi takes, hope it's okay if I use phi instead of, uh, phi for a map instead of for a chart. Uh, it shouldn't really make any difference. It's just, uh, uh, the, a letter that looks sort of like the letter F, but since we use F mostly for real variable, uh, real valued functions, we mostly use something like phi or C for functions that are uh, map manifolds to one another or multivariable maps. Um, so, uh, so we take this guy smooth, um, and then we have some point in here, and we let Q naught be the corresponding point uh, on Q. Um, and then um, I want to say that uh, phi prime of p naught, of course, is a linear map. It takes this guy to this guy to this guy. Okay, so uh, it takes tangent space to tangent space. And what I want to say is simply that this is invertible as a linear map uh, if and only if um, this guy is locally invertible. So we have to do the locally bit after perhaps replacing P and Q by open sets containing P naught and Q naught respectively, um, we can arrange that phi is a diffeomorphism. That is to say a smooth map with a smooth inverse, or in other words, it's a, it's a smooth map of manifolds with a smooth inverse map of manifolds. For the implicit function theorem, I want to give um, a somewhat different take on it, a different description of it. Somewhat uh, sound, sounds a little bit different from what we did for um, uh, several variable calculus. Um, first of all, I want to think about regular and critical points. Um, so a regular point of a smooth map so between manifolds is a point p naught in p. It's in the in the p naught in the q. It isn't in the q. Um, it's a point of, of p so that uh, phi prime at p at the linear map 
taking tangent space to tangent space um, is surjective. So it's onto linear map, taking tangent vectors to tangent vectors. Okay, and then a point's called a critical point to mean it's not a regular point. Okay, so um, if all points uh, are regular, we say that the map is a submersion. The map phi is a submersion. If all points are regular, all points of P are regular points, then it's a submersion. Okay, so um, so now we can state the implicit function theorem in this language of regular points. Um, so phi takes P to Q, um, uh, a smooth, a smooth map of manifolds. P naught and P is a regular point. Um, uh, then. Uh, uh, then we can say simply that there are, um, well, I should say P is P naught is regular. Maybe let's put it as if and only if, if and only if. Um, uh, there, uh, there are charts. In P and Q, so we can make charts on P and Q in which um, phi is identified. The charts, of course, each point is identified with point of Euclidean space, and so if you have a map, then its input points are identified with points in Euclidean space, its output points with points in Euclidean space, and so it can be identified with a map on Euclidean space. So it's identified with um, the map taking a bunch of x and y variables and forgetting the y variables and just keeping the x ones. Um, so that's the, the idea. It's a very, very simple kind of map. So much like we thought about before with the rank theorem, we want to know when is a map very, very simple in some charts. So that's the local picture of that map. And it says that if you have a regular point, then the map looks very, very boring in charts. Okay, so that's a, um, that's a one way to state the, uh, the implicit function theorem. I should say that it's the implicit function theorem. It's somewhat different from how we wrote it before, but it, you can easily check that it's equivalent by working out uh, the whole story in terms of charts. We often use the implicit function theorem to show that something is a manifold or is a submanifold, um, and uh, so let's say a, a regular value, value, q naught and q, is a point for which so that um, every uh, point p in p which maps to that Q naught is a regular point. So you're not going to have any pre-image uh, critical points. So a regular value is a point so that all the pre-images are regular points. And um, a trivial consequence of the, of the implicit function theorem, because it makes a, 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 a reg near a regular point, it makes a map just look like throwing away some variables. It has the, the trivial consequence that um, the um, pre-image um, phi inverse set q naught of any regular value is an embedded submanifold. The reason it's embedded an embedded submanifold is that locally uh, in the appropriate charts it just the, the map looks like this so you fix the value x the the image points you uh, fix the point q naught in the image so that fixes the values of the x variables and you let the y variables vary so it's fixed x variables and y variables are arbitrary and so as a submanifold it's given by the equations that fix the values of the x variables maybe we'll try a simple example of the implicit function theorem let's see what we can do with it to prove that something is is an, an embedded submanifold um, not a very sophisticated example, but we want to consider um, how we would, it, let's say in, in charts, how we would actually prove that something is an embedded submanifold. So I want to consider um, the, the set, um, let's say M is the set of points um, in uh, three-dimensional space uh, such that uh, X squared plus Y squared is Z and also uh, 
x squared plus z squared is y. This isn't a particularly sophisticated example, but it gives a sense of what sort of things we can solve using these techniques. Um, so I want to consider that this is going to be um, given by uh, so the inverse image of some point q naught and some q. So I'm going to have a p, which is going to be r3, and I'm going to have a map phi of uh, x, y, z is, uh, let's say, x squared plus y squared minus z, and x squared plus z squared minus y. Um, so phi takes p to q. Uh, so q here is simply r2, not very sophisticated manifolds. Um, and what I want to say is, uh, is, is I want to, I want to say that this thing is a, is a submanifold. In fact, I want to say it's a one-dimensional submanifold because it's basically it's given by taking three variables and putting two equations that should constrain two of the variables, leaving one left alone to be free. So, um, so what I'm hoping for is that it's going to turn out to be um, a result from the implicit function theorem for this function. Um, so what I what I want to see here is how to, how to set that up. So I've got uh, m is the points where these two equations are satisfied x squared plus y squared is z uh, means exactly the first component of this guy is 0, and x squared plus z squared is y means the second component is 0. So it's exactly phi inverse of the set of points 0, 0. Um, so there's a, an, an example of applying the, the, the theorem. Let's see if we can actually get it to work. Um, let's check what its, what its derivative matrix is. Remember that you calculate the derivative matrix as, um, let's get the names of these variables as, say, um, uh, u and v like we did before, so it's du dx, du dy, uh, well, du dz, dv dx, dv dy, dv dz. So, um, and we can just calculate those out. I won't uh, waste time on it, just write down the answer. Um, okay, so we might wonder um, whether or not this this matrix uh, is 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 a surjective linear map, we need to know if that's a surjective linear map, right? And how can we tell? We can look at two by two determinants. Okay, so if we look at the two by two determinant of this two by two block here, it'll be a surjective matrix, uh, surjective linear map, um, uh, when when that's uh, when that's a, a, a two by two invertible matrix. Certainly that that'll make it surjective, but it'd also be surjective if this one was. Uh, was an invertible matrix, and it'd also be surjective if this one was an invertible matrix. And in fact, of course, one of those would have to be true for it to be uh, to be surjective. So I won't go through the details, but um, you can check that um, uh, one of these three determinants, the determinant of this two by two, of this two by two, or that two by two, is uh, not zero, uh, except um, when um, we'd have to have uh, x is 0, or uh, y is minus a half, or z is minus a half. Okay? But we know that we're trying to be at this point on, on this, uh, this uh, set uh, m. We want to prove it's a manifold. So we want these to be 0. So we want x squared plus y squared to be z, and x squared plus z squared to be y. But if x squared plus y squared is z, then z can't be negative, and similarly y can't be negative. Um, so on M, uh, Z is greater than or equal to zero, and Y is greater than or equal to zero. So we don't have those problems of being minus a half. Okay, but then um, then we can also check that uh, again. I'm going to let you find the two by two determinants and check the various algebra that uh, that one of the determinants is non-zero except in those conditions. But then um, if X is zero. Uh, so we, we, we have to worry about the possibility of x being 0, y being minus a half, or z being minus a half. But where we're working, z and, and y are, are negative, so we're fine. But if x is 0, uh, I'm going to let you check that um, the remaining determinant becomes, well, becomes this determinant here. And for that to vanish, you'd need uh, 4yz to be 1 to um, have uh, trouble. Okay, so if th something to go wrong, uh, m to fail to be somehow a manifold according to the implicit function theorem, uh, the implicit function theorem not to uh, tell us what's going on, we'd have to have uh, this kind of trouble. Um, and then you can check that's inconsistent because, um, uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll leave you to check that if you plug in x is 0, 4yz is 1 into the equations x squared plus y squared is z and uh, 
x squared plus z squared is y. So you'd have to have all those equations uh, hold in order to have any trouble. And I'll leave you to check that that's an inconsistent system of equations. And so um, that tells us the implicit function theorem applies uh, at every point. Well, near every point, let's say. Near every point uh, of, uh, of m. And so, therefore, m is an embedded submanifold. Not a very sophisticated example, again, but um, it's just given by two simple quadratic equations, each of which is really just drawing a paraboloid. If we go back to the original m, it's, uh, it's given by, we've got three-dimensional space, and in there we've got um, some paraboloid given by z is x squared plus y squared, so like this. And then we've got another paraboloid given by uh, going out along the y-axis. And uh, I always forget which one the physicists like to draw as the y-axis, so I get to make it up because I don't remember. Um, and so it's the intersection of those two paraboloids, and it's not immediately clear what that looks like. It's a bit difficult to picture in your head. So, But it, it is, according to this, actually a smooth curve. So finally, we want to state on manifolds our, our uh, third, third of our big three theorems. We want to state the rank theorem. Um, so a map, a smooth map of manifolds, V takes P to Q, all of our maps are smooth maps of manifolds from here on in, so this guy is said to be of constant rank. Constant rank. If the rank of the linear map, uh, phi prime of P, uh, is constant, as p uh, varies in big P. Okay, so we have this manifold big P, and you put a little point in it, P, and then move it around and check the rank of that map. It's said to be constant rank, a map is constant rank, if the rank of the linear map is constant. So um, now we can state the rank theorem It says that a um, a smooth map has constant rank, constant uh, uh, constant rank, if and only if it is um, uh, linear in some some charts near each point. So you pick up a chart on P and a chart on Q, and you'd get it to be linear um, as a map, identified as a linear map. Um, so in other words, that there's some there's some uh, way to, to identify the open sets of the manifold uh, P, open sets of the corresponding manifold Q and near the corresponding points, so that everything turns out to be just a linear map. So that's a very convenient way to think of it. Um, in fact, of course, all linear maps are really the same as long as they have the same rank. Uh, they, they really don't, it doesn't matter which linear map, so you might as well just make it be your favorite linear map. Say, for example, you could take some input variables um, and map them to some output variables by uh, this linear map is a linear map which has rank k. It, f it keeps the first k of the variables and then stuffs in a bunch of zeros at the end, so it forgot the p minus k variables at the end here, dropped them, and then stuffed in some zeros instead. That's what the, that's what these maps all look like. So it's constant rank, even though it's linear in some in some uh, some charts. And by the the same sort of analysis, that um, if uh, uh, um, if we found that uh, we had a constant rank map, phi is constant rank, then it's also clear that uh, phi inverse of any point is an embedded submanifold. In P. Um, and it's by exactly the same observations that is true for linear maps. Um, you could make in some in some sort of chart, you could choose your chart so that Q naught becomes the origin and then uh, the the points that map to Q naught become the kernel of a linear map. Um, so, uh, because linear map, the kernel of a linear map is an embedded submanifold, it's clear that this thing is an embedded submanifold. Let's work out a, 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 a somewhat abstract but more serious example. 
instead of a couple of equations, let's actually think about, uh, as an example, um, consider the orthogonal matrices, so n by n matrix, real matrix, let's say. A is cause said to be orthogonal. This should be something you saw in linear algebra. Um, if uh, A transpose times A is the identity, I'll write little t for transpose here. Um, it's a real matrix. Um, so that's what an orthogonal matrix is, and then the orthogonal group ON is the set of uh, all n by n orthogonal matrices. In the lecture notes, we come up actually with some explicit charts on this thing. Um, but let's uh, show that it's a, it's a manifold by this, um, this implicit function theorem, uh, or sorry, this rank theorem. Um, so we'll do a simple rank theorem calculation. Um, what we'll do is first to construct a map, um, phi takes all the, let's write n by n for n by n matrices, and it takes uh, n by n matrices to n by n matrices by simply taking phi of a is A transpose A. And so therefore the orthogonal group is exactly phi inverse of the identity matrix. It's the matrices that get mapped to the identity by phi. So now we have to check and see if this thing has constant rank. Now luckily there are no abstract manifolds P and Q here. P, uh, the manifold P is just n by n matrices, which we think of as, as Rn squared. As a, so it's, it's a just um, the Euclidean space of dimension n squared. This is also Euclidean space of dimension n squared. So there are no abstract manifolds here, and that makes it possible to differentiate without having to make any charts. We can differentiate by simply saying that if we expand out, uh, we take a matrix A and we want to differentiate around A, we take a little perturbation, say epsilon B, some tiny little epsilon number, and we calculate out what that gives us. Um, so that's A plus epsilon B times uh, sorry, transpose times um, a plus epsilon b. Um, so, um, so that gives us. Um, is that what I want to do? Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, that gives us. Uh, if you expand that out, you get a transpose a, and then you get epsilon times uh, b transpose a plus a transpose b, and then plus there's an epsilon squared term which I don't need to write down because I only want to calculate the first derivative of this map. So you can see the first derivative of the map, if you send epsilon to zero, you get that it's the linear term here. So it, phi prime of a, and now this is a bit confusing. Uh, this is a linear map. I should think of it not as a matrix, but as a linear map. It's a linear map. At, at, for each matrix a, I get a linear map. The linear map takes uh, each uh, matrix, uh, which is an input to it. So that should be thought of as some sort of input to this linear map. And the output of the linear map is this derivative here, b transpose a plus a transpose b. Okay, so that's the input and that's the output. Um, okay, so so that's uh, uh, thought of as an abstract linear map that eats matrices and spits out matrices. To apply the theorem, we need to be able to figure out if this map has constant rank. It turns out it doesn't have constant rank. So we'll have to apply it not on the whole uh, set of n by n matrices, but just on some open subset. So um, let's let, uh, say, u be the set of n by n invertible matrices. A lot of the examples that we're going to do in this class are to do with linear algebra. Um, so we're going to use linear algebra as a kind of um, a source of examples of differential geometry, but we're going to use differential geometry to strengthen linear algebra as well. Okay, so we're going to take this as the invertible matrices, and that's exactly the set of matrices, n by n matrices, A, so that the determinant is not zero. And the determinant's a continuous function, so this is an open set an open set in the n by n matrices because it's the set where a continuous function is non-zero. So on that set, I have this map phi takes me to the, um, the n by n matrices, which is um, phi of a is uh, a, 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 what am I doing, a transpose a. Um, so now what I found is that the derivative um, is a linear transformation eating a matrix B 
and spitting out what do I want to say it's going to spit out um, uh, what was it it was uh, B transpose A plus A transpose B um, now what I can do is I can identify this linear expression by letting C be um, uh, be A transpose times B then uh, B is of course a transpose inverse times C and that makes perfect sense because A is invertible so A transpose is invertible um, it says transpose and inverse commute so that makes perfect sense so these uh, are, uh, are uh, identifying um, each matrix B with a matrix C and vice versa and then this expression becomes exactly uh, C transpose plus C so um, phi prime of A B is 0. Let's find the kernel of the linear map phi prime of A. It's 0 if and only if C transpose plus C is 0. So if and only if C is anti-symmetric. It's a clever trick to replace the B variables by C variables in such a way as to simplify the equation. And then you can see exactly what the answer is. You make C anti-symmetric and then you simply let B be A transpose inverse C. And that'll automatically give us uh, the solutions of this equation. And so it'll give us the kernel. But that means the kernel is the same dimension for any A, because these matrices just have to be anti-symmetric. You can pick any anti-symmetric matrix C, you set B up this way, and you get it uh, into the kernel. And conversely, if you're in the kernel, you get a, a C out of this guy, um, and, then, and then it's anti-symmetric. Not C out of this guy, and then it's anti-symmetric. So, um, so that means that that uh, the dimension of the kernel of uh, phi prime of A is the dimension of the space of a set of anti-symmetric matrices. And so that's constant. So if the dimension of the kernel is constant, then the dimension of the image is constant, and so uh, phi has constant rank. So phi is constant rank on... on U. So it's a constant rank map. We could have called it P instead of U, perhaps. Maybe that would be more fitting with the notation. Um, so it's a constant rank map, and therefore M is uh, phi inverse of the identity is um, is uh, a manif an embedded submanifold. But what was that M? That was the, exactly, that was the equation being mapped to the identity is exactly the equation of the orthogonal group. So we found the orthogonal group sits inside the n by n matrices as an embedded submanifold. And it's an easy exercise to show that it's actually uh, it's actually compact. Okay, so um, so that gives us a serious example of applying the um, applying the rank theorem. Uh, so we now have the, our three big theorems. Um, and again, I said that you may not have been familiar with those from several variable calculus, but they are several variable calculus theorems in the standard textbooks, and we can now copy them over to, to the theory of manifolds, and we can use them to construct new manifolds by, cons by solving uh, complicated systems of equations. In our next lecture, we'll uh, use these sort of results to try to embed the Grismanian into the n by n matrices to see it as a as a more concrete uh, example of an embedded submanifold to Euclidean space.